meeting and Rob Slater will be starting his talk momentarily. Momentarily, as, as soon as I can get it to actually. Oh, recording has started, it tells oh. me. Okay. Okay. Well, there I guess. We um, okay. I guess we're ready to roll. So, um, okay. so I guess, well, I could say, well, welcome everyone, all several of us to the, uh, what's this, the <laughs> fifth meeting in a series? This is the um, sixth meeting in the a series. The sixth meeting. See, this is why I'm not usually the host. I can't even count properly. So the ever interesting Rob Slade with lots of little stories. So feel free to ask a question whenever, because Rob's got stories galore. Enough stories to fill <laughs> several books. Indeed, indeed. I should get around to writing the storybooks one of these days. <laughs> Actually, I've been, I've been, because I'm moving, just one last little side, because I'm moving, I'm unearthing things and I found a whole bunch of old uh, Dika stuff. Ah. So, they, oh my gosh, I got to go through this and, and find old references to people who I forgot about and people who I still keep in track of, such as yourself. So, oh God. I'm sure I'm going to find some old quotes from Rob Slade says that by 1990, this will happen or something. <laughs> yes. Never, as, as somebody said, never make predictions about anything that can be checked within your lifetime. That's good advice. <laughs> All right. I'm going to get to the serious part there. And I'm going to um, hand it over to you, Rob. Off you go. Okay. Uh, well, tonight is differential privacy night. And uh, we have uh, a fair amount more material than we did last time. So hopefully we'll get through uh, everything in the time allotted. Um, and just to uh, uh, keep up with things, the next meeting, the seventh meeting, uh, is on May the 4th at uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time. And we're going to be talking about InfoSec ethics at that time. And there is the... Uh, the URL for it. Oh, and let me see. I'll just get into the chat and all the the URLs and and everything as usual. I'll just fire in there. Oops, wrong one. That's um, that's not it. Uh, somewhere here, I've I'll have it. Okay, there we go. There's the details on me and details on upcoming and details on uh, the slides for today. Uh, so anyways, there's uh, there's the link for the next meeting and uh, some explanation of the next meeting and uh, the videos, my my YouTube channel. Uh, I've uh, done uh, posted the recordings that we've we've done so far. So uh, uh, they're all up there. And now, uh, since we're talking about privacy, of course, uh, just to let you know, yes, this uh, meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on the uh, YouTube channel. And so, yes, you are being watched uh, in terms of privacy and confidentiality and all of that kind of stuff. So CISSP question time, by the way, I of course, I keep on mentioning CISSP. Um, next month, uh, May, I think it's May 17th to 21, I'm going to be teaching a CISSP review seminar for New York Institute of Technology Vancouver campus. And uh, they are allowing uh, non NYIT students to register for that. Uh, so contact NYIT Vancouver campus if you are interested in that. But uh, so CISSP question time, which of the following is not part of differential privacy, database queries, network calculus, noise or privacy budget? And the answer, of course, is B, which probably everyone will have gotten wrong or something. But anyways, um, in terms of differential privacy, it is a bit odd because where, well, at, at the same time, of course, I was uh, reviewing and updating my slides for this uh, NYIT review course. Uh, but where, you know, I, I was thinking about differential privacy, which you probably will not see on the exam yet, but where do I put it in the domains? Um, 
and traditionally privacy has been discussed in the law investigation and ethics domain but it's not that kind of privacy really it's it's not the kind of privacy that we normally think of so that's uh, a sort of a a bit of a problem well does it go in cryptography and why cryptography you ask well there's lots of math and lots of similar concepts to those that we run into in cryptography uh, there are and, and like cryptography there are lots of interrelated parts and so it's very difficult to structure how you're going to talk about differential privacy so i apologize in advance if uh, this seems a bit disjointed the whole topic is a bit disjointed um, and different people who are researching and and developing differential privacy are doing so in different ways and exploring different aspects of it all under this this umbrella concept of, of differential privacy uh, and so it you know it's interesting as you go and and start reading things you know one paper will be really concentrating in in one area and another paper will be really concentrating in another area and you wonder sometimes if they are actually talking about the same thing but yes they are it's just a fairly messy topic so um what about security management because there's all kinds of issues of measures and metrics and budgets and risk management involved in differential privacy um, how do we make this work? How much do we want it to work? How much effort do we want to put into making it work? How important is it to us? So, uh, you know, maybe it's it's in that area. Or is it in the application security domain? Because most of it really has to do with database security and some really difficult problems in database security that we have been looking at for a number of years. Uh, many, well, uh, a depressingly large number of years. Uh, I've, uh, there's a book, um, Research, Research Directions in, in Database Security by Lunt, um, and I believe it was published like 30 years ago. And basically all the problems that he listed in that book are still still with us. Uh, however, some of them uh, may be addressable by some of the concepts in, in differential privacy. So uh, it could be some interesting stuff. Um, but as I said, it's you know, it's not privacy privacy. It's it's not that kind of privacy. It's not um, what we typically think of um, when we talk about privacy. Although, of course, you talk to, yeah, you know, privacy of, is a very personal matter and, and people uh, tend to be interested in, in their own personal privacy, um, not very interested in theoretical or legal aspects of it. Um, and it's, it's funny, as a security maven, um, I'm not that, concerned with privacy. I mean, here it is. I'm, you know, uh, posting this stuff. I'm, I'm putting it up on a YouTube channel. I, you know, there's all kinds of people uh, watching this that I have no idea who they are. Um, but the, you know, it, it's, it, you know, I'm, I'm just not that concerned about it personally. Now, Gloria is. So I definitely have to be careful and and deliberately careful about uh, my privacy when I'm speaking. Do I give any information away um, that Gloria would consider to violate her privacy? Because, of course, we're married. So um, and and so I've had to do that very deliberately, which is probably a good thing for a security maven eventually because uh, it means that I am looking at it ob objectively, um, trying to look at it formally, trying to see the different aspects, looking at the, the legal aspects, looking at confidentiality, confidentiality aspects of it, so on and so forth. 
And one of the interesting aspects of that is in recent discussions about differential privacy, um, something that I posted prompted a, a bit of discussion with one person and he said, is differential privacy really about anonymity rather than privacy? Which I thought was an interesting statement or 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 question to to pose. Um, you know, a lot of people wouldn't see a difference. Is is privacy and anonymity the same thing? But you know, maybe they aren't. Uh, but that's it's the type of of question that may give us more of a an idea, a, a real idea about differential privacy. But in order to do that, I probably should be talking about differential privacy. Now, again, as I said, it's a lot of it has to do with database security, in particular, inference attacks and aggregation attacks. Um, and these, uh, we have, you know, formally talked about that in terms of database security and that sort of thing, but it may not be um, readily uh, apparent to people what those actually are. And in fact, an awful lot of the time uh, when we talk about it these days, we're using uh, a term called open source intelligence. And that is basically, this is um, information that is freely available, information that we should have or that there is no restriction on us having. Uh, and that allowing us to infer information that maybe we shouldn't have or that somebody would be concerned about us having. And again, having information from multiple sources, which may be uh, not very informative on their own in, in isolation, but aggregated together um, may give us information that, that people would be concerned about us having. Um, and uh, in, in terms of the aggregation, um, perhaps, uh, well, social media and, and Facebook and, and Google are probably the prime examples there. Um, you are uh, posting an awful lot of information about yourself or using the Google tools. And the fact that all of this is is being tracked and, and uh, at, at least collected, um, not necessarily related individually to you, but just, you know, all the, the requests that are being made. Um, it, there was some some work a few years ago and it was it turned out to be uh, really quite surprisingly easy to de-anonymize uh, bulk data that Google had. Uh, again, this is this is not tracked by individuals, but because of the bulk data, um, researchers were able to go in there, look at the stuff and uh, simply by looking at the patterns in this mass of data, uh, they were able to narrow down to individuals and uh, collect information about individuals in uh, some very surprising ways. Um, and uh, there are other uh, things. That, the one that comes to mind is is the uh, weather tracker on on Twitter. Somebody is has collected or or just you know reads all the all the tweets that people make and looks for keywords. You know like sunny, cloudy, rain, that sort of thing. And by collecting all that data, looking at the uh, locations of the accounts that that post these things. Um, they have generated a real-time weather map of the United States uh, indicating what the, the weather is like all over the United States just using that open source intelligence. And so that, you know, from the tweets people make, they can infer what the weather is like in a given area. So um, now, is that dangerous? Well, it depends on how 
important you think your privacy is or, you know, but uh, they in in the case of uh, well, in the case of the weather, you know, a lot of people would say who cares, but in the case of the um, the Google uh, uh, de-anonymization studies, um, like I say, they were able to identify individuals and uh, track uh, those people's social networks in, in terms of the people they actually have contact with and communicate with. Um, they were able to identify interests and uh, political leanings, all kinds of things um, that people would normally consider at least starting to be personal. And, and I'm sure that in uh, some of that research, they were able to trace things like uh, sexual preferences and things like that, that some people will really uh, be concerned about keeping private. So, um, you know, this is the reality that we live in. Um, and, you know, I, I say that, you know, the uh, the research was done with with Google's data, but um, you know Facebook is is already doing that themselves and making it available to outside companies who are then turning around and selling that data to advertisers, vendors, uh, political parties. You know, all kinds of of research is going on. It's just that um, Facebook is not as open about what they're doing. Um, and and doesn't uh, have uh, published studies that are being cited in in those regards. So, you know, this is this is our world now. Um, anyway, uh, differential privacy, as I say, it's it's not easy to pin down. It's it's not easy to define. It's not a single entity. Or, or concept, and in that way, it's kind of like uh, blockchain. Uh, blockchain is a combination of distributed database and uh, certification and digital signatures, um, and varies in, in implementation. Uh, and I'll get in more into that um, in a few weeks down the road, we'll talk about NFTs. But, um, Differential privacy is is not just rebranding, which an awful lot of uh, new technologies are, but it is a number of old ideas that are put together. And aggregation, um, and we've talked a little bit about that, but you know, aggregation is is a known problem, and anonymization and database design are non-trivial problems and that sort of thing. But um, we already have, we, we do use aggregation as a defense sometimes, as, as well as an attack. Um, noise and randomization, and, and I know that uh, every time I talk about that in, in terms of databases, people go, you know, what? What are you talking about? Um, but we, we do talk about noise and, and randomization um, in uh, some aspects and, and have done. Um, and differential privacy uh, doesn't really change that, but it, it puts it on a more formal footing. Uh, query restrictions and limits. Um, again, that's that's all part of uh, database query uh, design and and limitations so that people are not able to make queries about the wrong things. So uh, again, you know those are uh, not new things, but uh, differential privacy puts them together in uh, into one. Well, I don't know whether one package. I mean, like blockchain, the the implementations vary, but it it does put them together, and it has come up with some new concepts. And the privacy budget is a very interesting one that has come out of this. Now, uh, again, going over some of these uh, topics, aggregation can be used from both attack and defense getting info you shouldn't have from sets that you should have. And the uh, uh, major uh, paper uh, that that really started people formally looking into this is is the tracker and the uh, the URL there. Uh, again, that's in the URL that I pumped into the the chat there. Um, def 
now, but it's also can be used for defense. And so we provide people with information in bulk rather than individually. For example, we will give people. Um, oh, we will give people. Uh, uh, average salaries for a uh, municipality or neighborhood, but we will not give uh, people's individual salaries, uh, at least, you know, not to to everybody. So uh, again, aggregating the data and, and taking averages and that sort of thing, that is one of the things that we use for defense. Um, in uh, an example for for the defense, in a table presenting the sales of each business in a town grouped by business categories. A cell that has information from only one company, if there's only one company doing business in that one business category, that data might be suppressed so that we are not giving out one company's specific sales figures or specific uh, business information. So, you know, there, there's uh, uh, issues with regard to, to aggregation and, and restrictions on, on whether or not uh, we can provide non aggregated data. Um, it is surprisingly difficult to protect uh, against aggregation attacks. And uh, one of the papers uh, involved in differential privacy has come up with the fundamental law of information recovery. In the most general case, privacy cannot be protected without injecting some amount of noise. There's that word again, and we are definitely going to see that again. Now, data can't be fully anonymized and remain useful. And we've seen this specifically in the, the COVID pandemic with the contact tracing. Um, if you use the, the full proper DP3T algorithm for contact tracing, you're just collecting random numbers. It doesn't have any identifiable data. You know, that's it. It's just random data. But the thing is that that doesn't give you very much information. Um, it does say Yes, you were in contact, but were you in contact behind a barrier where, you know, uh, you, you can be within 15 feet of somebody and, and therefore exchange the, the random numbers, but not um, you know, be in any danger of communicating the virus. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's all kinds of issues. But as soon as you start saying, where that random number was collected or when that random number was collected, you start getting uh, into issues of uh, losing anonymity. And and so, you know, there's this balance between utility and and anonymity. Uh, so uh, anyways, Data, sorry, differential privacy is not just anonymization. It's not just removal of personally identifiable information. Uh, and, and we'll talk a bit more about this when we get into Apple's uh, specifics. And it's uh, it's really interesting because they've been really pushing uh, differential privacy. Anyways, back to noise. So another CISSP question, which of the following is not an effective deterrent against a database inference attack. Uh, partitioning, small query sets, noise and perturbation, and cell suppression. And uh, of course, I, lo I love this. I've used this question for years and most people B. get it wrong. Is it B? Is it B? It's not B. Oh. It's not B. Uh, the, the one that is, which of the following is not an effective deterrent? Um, actually, yeah, it's B. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, well, you know, uh, which which is not an effective deterrent. Well, uh, you know, partitioning is not. Um, it you know, partitioning. Um, uh, well, it, it, partitioning sort of is is an effective. Uh, deterrent because if if we can partition the data so that in in such a way that um, 
we we don't actually have uh, the the personal information in there, then maybe we can you know uh, protect against the inference. Um, if uh, you know uh, cell suppression is is something we we very often say. Well, I just mentioned you know suppressing a cell uh, that does that. So cell suppression is is in a sense a sort of a special case of partitioning. So yes that is a deterrent and so we're left with small query sets of noise and perturbation and, and of course uh now there Vern, great good uh because uh most people choose noise and perturbation because they think oh you know you cannot inject noise into a database you you can't inject noise into query responses and that sort of thing well actually if you really want an an effective deterrent noise and perturbation is a very effective deterrent there and uh, small query sets, no, small query sets allow people to mount inference attacks by specifying uh, in very targeted ways what they what they want to look for and what they want to infer out of it. So yes, very good. Vern gets a, a one ten thousandth of a CISSP certificate for getting the right answer on that one. Yeah, uh, so you can you can sign up for the course and, and maybe you can get the whole thing anyway. Um, so. This is this may. Seem like we're going off in a different direction, but no. Um, pr this is something that has been used in the social sciences and it's called privacy by randomized process. Um, we are in a, we are adding noise and trying to get real answers. And the reason that we're doing this is we're talking, we're trying to collect information, statistical information, not necessarily personal information, but statistical information about embarrassing or illegal behavior. So if we ask people, have you ever murdered anyone? You know, of course, everybody's gonna say no. Um, so then we say, okay, you know, we, we're not gonna ask you that, uh, but uh, we will we will ask you uh, whether you've murdered anyone in the following way. You flip a coin. If it ends up tails, then you tell us whether or not you've done that. If it ends up heads, then flip a second coin or flip the coin a second time and respond yes if heads and no if tails. Now. We're obviously, you know, by flipping the coin, uh, flipping two coins, in fact, um, we are obviously injecting a lot of noise into the data that we're collecting. But we know what that noise is. We know how random it is and we know how much it is. And by saying, you know, there's, there's only a 50% chance that we're actually going to ask you to respond truthfully and therefore nobody will ever know whether you responded truthfully or not. Uh, this gives people the confidence to, you know, on the occasion that they're asked to respond truthfully to, to possibly do that. And we can then statistically take out that noise and still collect statistically valid information. Um, and so this process allows us to you know a, a better chance of collecting uh data in embarrassing or illegal situations where people would otherwise just lie to us and uh so in in fact by injecting noise we're getting a more accurate answer which is a really bizarre concept but that's the way it works uh, so, um, uh, this is, this is just a, a graphical representation of it, you know, for, uh, each entry, flip a coin, if it's heads, tell the truth, if it's tails, flip another coin, and heads say yes, tails say no. Uh, and again, because of that, um, we know that you know, 50% of this data is going to be random. We can actually, you know, we can statistically remove that and 
uh, get the get to uh, what is a, a very accurate uh, result out of this. So this is how we can use uh, noise to get more accurate information and protect privacy at the same time. Now, differential privacy, why is it called differential privacy? Well, if the algorithm that we're using is differentially private, uh, it's if, if the effect of making an arbitrary single substitution in the database is small enough, the query result can't be used to infer much about any single individual. So if we have a very large database and we have you know, one entry per person there and, and so a, a very large number of people involved in the data, then we can't say very much about any single individual. Uh, and and we're, we're going to come back to that uh, a, a little bit later in, in when we come to what uh, differential privacy is going to rely on and and when we talk about the privacy budget. So is there any <laughs> useful, uh, you know, privacy invading, confidentiality breaking difference in query results between a database with this person in the databases or one without? If there isn't any difference, that's differentially private. Um, now, that uh, you will immediately see is probably problematic uh, because there's still going to be a difference, you know, when when you get into enough detail. So differential privacy is not an absolute and we'll talk about this again later uh it's not binary it, you don't either have it or don't have it it's how <clears throat> excuse me how much do you have how much differential privacy do we want to provide or can we provide in a certain situation so um there we go. A constraint on the algorithms used to publish aggregate information about a statistical database, which limits the disclosure of private information or records whose information is in the database. So differential privacy is the, the restrictions, the uh, constraints, the, the safeguards that we um, use in the algorithms used to publish and, and remember that word there publish aggregate information um, an algorithm is differentially privacy private if an observer seeing its output cannot tell if a particular individual's information was used in the confirmation does this you know is this person part of the result that we see um, and if we can't tell whether that person is or isn't, then that's differentially private. So, uh, again, that word publish. This is about queries on the database. If you have full access to the database, of course, all bets are off. You know, if, if you can read everything in the database, this is not in you know, a differential privacy doesn't make any difference. It's about the queries, the, the results, the, the publication of data out of that database. Um, so this is not, not full access. You know, if somebody has full access, it, there is no question. You don't have differential privacy. Um, it's very statistically oriented and there's a heavy mathematical involvement here. The implementation is different. The implementation is non-trivial. It's not binary, as I said. It's it's not that you have or don't have differential privacy. It's how much differential privacy or privacy do you want? And this is where we get to the concept of the privacy budget, or they talk about uh, privacy accounting. Now, as I said, here's here's sort of the the characteristics that we can use to tune the uh, 
uh, well, the privacy budget, the privacy accounting, and how much differential privacy we are going to provide, going to be able to provide. So the more records that you have in a database, the less an individual matters. So for example, when Google released its, its aggregate data, um, they, I mean, it was anonymized and, and that sort of thing. They figured that that was safe because you had huge, huge numbers of records. And so any individual query would just get lost in, in that sea. Um, what they, they didn't bank on was uh, the differences between casual and really heavy users. Because the more records per individual, the greater the privacy loss. So the more total records, the, the less privacy loss, the more records per individual, by an individual subject, the, you know, greater privacy loss there. If you allow more queries on it, and again, that comes back to the, the uh, uh, CISSP question earlier, the, uh, you know, allowing small query sets, uh, more queries, tuning the queries allows for greater privacy loss. If you inject more noise into the system, there is going to be less privacy loss. And the maximum allowable privacy loss is going to be your privacy budget. At least that's the theory there. Uh, this again, uh, you know, I mentioned cryptography earlier on, and certainly here um, we we see the relation in cryptography. Every message that you send gives away one bit of the key. Now, very often it's the same bit in in uh, uh, numerous situations, but every every time that you use a cryptographic key to encrypt something you're basically giving away and you know more information about that key and so that's why um we talk about the fact that you can't use the same key forever if you use it to do a lot of uh encryption and uh why you need to change keys on a, on a regular basis uh, so in the same way uh, the more records that an individual has in the database, the more information starts to be given away about them. And, and having the privacy budget, having the privacy accounting is how do we, how do we determine this and put a restriction on how much information does get thrown away. But Remember from risk management, an outsider can do a vulnerability assessment or a, a pen test or uh, you know something like that, uh, red teaming, blue teaming, that sort of thing. But nobody can do a final risk analysis for you because they don't know the asset value to you. And so in the same way, you know, a privacy budget really can't be set for you because People don't know how much your your privacy is important to you, and and what type of privacy is important to you, and that's that is subject to all kinds of subjective factors. So, uh, some of which can be, for example. Uh, my daughter refuses to fill this out, pointing out the many fields that prove that her new teacher is trying to steal her identity. And there's actually an awful lot of information there about uh, this is obviously a, a math uh, class and, and they're trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get the kids thinking about the, their numbers. Uh, you know, the number of pets I have, my bedtime is a number, my house number uh, is a number and that sort of thing. But uh, yes, I mean, she's she's quite right that there's, you know, there's an awful lot of information there that could be used to steal your identity. And it's interesting that the only uh, thing that she was willing to, to fill in was uh, my height is four foot two. 
so uh, interesting to look at that. But again, you know, how, <clears throat> sorry, how important is your privacy to you? Now, again, we've talked about functional security requirements and assurance requirements. So can we make an assurance requirement with privacy accounting? Can we figure out a, a way that people can be assured of the, the amount of privacy uh, that this, uh, well, a, a given system, for example, uh, can provide and then can choose whether or not to use it um, given the, uh, uh, the privacy budget in, involved with that. So there's there's something and and differential privacy is definitely the quantitative risk analysis of privacy in that nobody ever uses quantitative risk analysis. Now we, we teach it definitely we teach. Um, uh, qualitative risk analysis, quantitative risk analysis, um, and we also teach the fact that or at least we should teach the fact that Everybody uses qualitative risk analysis rather than quantitative risk analysis. And I even I at one point I, I pursued this because, of course, I'm you know teaching on six continents, uh, teaching security people. And, and I started asking and, and nobody nobody used quantitative risk analysis. And, and uh, I waited until one uh, particular seminar where I had a whole bunch of bankers on there and I figured, you know, well, bankers, they've got computers. They, you know, they're all about the numbers and accuracy and that sort of thing. Surely they would do quantitative risk analysis. Uh, nope, none of them used quantitative risk analysis. And so I was thinking about that again and thinking, OK, well, that particular seminar was in the United States. American banks are smaller than Canadian banks. So the next time I was teaching in Canada and I had a lot of bankers in the room, I asked that. And no, nobody used. Well, as a matter of fact, one uh, one person from one bank uh, said yes, they were using quantitative risk analysis for one particular project, a very limited project, and that was the the only time they had ever done that. Quantitative risk analysis is just it involves an awful lot of work, it involves an awful lot of data, it involves an awful lot of resources, time, people, expense, and it's just I, I think people put a risk analysis into this and, and just decided quantitative risk analysis isn't worth it. And uh, it would be interesting to do a, a, an octave uh, assessment of that since octave is a risk analysis uh, framework that is just so difficult that nobody ever uses it, at least nobody with uh, you know less than 5,000 employees in the company. Um, uh, it's fortunate that the, the Octave people went and developed Allegro so that people could in fact do a little bit of risk analysis, but uh, it's it seems that people have um, uh, done sort of the risk analysis and, and said, you know, it's it's simply not worth it. The, the uh, benefit we're going to get out of this is just not worth the, the work that we're going to have to put into quantitative risk analysis. And that is very possibly what is going to happen with differential privacy. It is an interesting tech. Well, I, I hesitate to say it's a technology, but you know, group of technologies. It's an interesting concept, even though it's not a single concept. And it may produce some worthwhile research, but I don't know how many companies are ever actually going to pursue differential privacy in reality, and that includes Apple. So, do we need a break at this point? Um, I guess we could have a short little break, just so those of us who need to uh, have a quick walk and come back. Yes get rid of the coffee that we previously drank and and then uh, get some more coffee for the second round and and is tm willing to to identify him or herself yet well that's okay you can remain differentially private <laughs> <There>. <laughs> but that's that's me i don't know what tm is but that's mahinder 
Oh, okay. I don't know where this TM came from, but maybe whatever. Interesting. Okay. Well. Yeah. Anyways, we'll, oh. we'll just give it a couple of minutes and uh, we'll resume minutes, back. We can't in... do anything in a couple of minutes. Hmm? Sorry. We cannot do anything in a couple of minutes. Well, you can walk to the bathroom or something. Yeah. We... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. We're all older, so it's like it takes a bit longer than. Uh, well, we re we will resume at eight. How about that? Is that enough time? <laughs> That's definitely okay. enough time. Okay. Okay. Talk two boys in a bit. Yep. Are you still there, Mohinder? I'm going. I'm going. going. Oh, well, carry on. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm back. Oh, kidok. <laughs> Did you go? Nope. Oh. I'm fine. But, yeah, but you, you're a young guy, so that's no problem. Ah, uh, it's a relatively term. That's a relative term. <laughs> it's a defense of privacy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess it depends who your audience is. It's like, is there privacy or not? Oh, what's yeah. going on here? It looks like Rob must be back as well here. You just changed the slide. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Rob is back. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to. I, I, I usually put in, you know, cartoons or comics or, or something like that to uh, remind myself that uh, it's probably time to take a break. So, yeah, anyway. Well, seeing as how it's just us, we can keep on going if you guys are okay. Yeah. Okay. By the way, Vern, if Angela wanders through the room, say hi. Okay. One is flashing. Sorry? One is flashing. Vern is flashing. Yes, I know Vern is flashing, but we we won't talk about that. <laughs> Vern's personal predilections. Okay. Um. Anyway, uh, sort of second second half here. Um. Uh, in in a sense, I'm going to say the same thing. In uh, the more formal language that's used by. Uh, some of the research papers. So uh, hopefully some of, of these issues uh, and, and presentations uh, might uh, make some of the, the earlier material possibly a, a bit clearer, um, I hope. And, and then we'll go on to uh, some other things about applications and, and uh, the, the use in the real world here. So, um, this is 
<laughs> I don't. I, I assume they they may be talking about epsilon differential privacy and and uh, the epsilon function here. I tend to think of it myself as e differential privacy, which is uh, probably has implications that they uh, didn't intend. But uh, anyways, a person's privacy cannot be prompt compromised by a statistical release if their data are not in the database. Well, that's you know that's fairly obvious. Um, if your data isn't there, it can't be released. Um, with differential privacy, the goal is to give each individual roughly the same privacy that would result from having their data removed or not being in the database in the first place. Mm. <laughs> so the statistical functions run on the database shouldn't produce results that depend overly much on the data of any one individual. So that's, you know, formally um, what we should be trying to design into the, uh, well, not the database itself, not the design of the database. As I say, if you've got full access, um, you know, you have zero privacy anyways as Scott McNeely would say, but the um, the design of the, the reporting, the, the publishing of results um, should have safeguards behind it uh, that prevents us from getting too much information from any one individual's information that's in that database. Uh, the key insight of differential privacy is that as the query is made on the data of fewer and fewer people, more noise needs to be added to the result to produce the same amount of privacy. So again, if, if we have a very large database with very few records from any given individual, then that's going to be fairly differentially private. As the either the database shrinks, or the number of records from uh, identifiable individuals grows, then we need to produce or, or inject more noise into the results from any given query to produce the same amount of privacy. So uh, again, uh, let me see if I can go back to, uh, yeah, the, again, the, the privacy budget uh, slide here. Again, the more records, the less an individual matters, more records per individual, greater privacy loss, more queries, greater privacy loss, more noise, less privacy loss. So um, there are different ways that we can look at this. There are different ways than we can uh, make something differentially private, but we uh, we we need to be deliberate in terms of how we pursue those, and and we need to examine ways in which uh, you know more records per individual, fewer records per database um, need to be addressed in different ways. Now the privacy budget, of course, this is this is related here. Um, we can say not too many items for any one individual or mm, we need more total uh, records. Or if we don't have a huge number of total records and we have a lot of data from one individual, we need to inject more noise into any queries. So different ways to address the privacy budget, uh, different ways to to work on it. Um, now, uh, this is this is not too old here. You know, again, um, one of the earliest papers that I was able to find uh, on on this um, uh, at least in in terms of specifically using the the term differential privacy, uh, is this paper from 2006, and and you will notice it's it's from a crypto conference. Um, 
it's in in that paper they were talking about a mathematical definition of differential privacy uh, and a mechanism based on the addition of noise. Um, they had uh, either Laplace noise or exponential uh, or uh, posterior sampling distributions to, to uh, inject noise into the results that satisfied their mathematical definition in terms of differential privacy to a certain extent. And there's the mathematical formula for it. So, you know, do that and you're good. Well, <laughs> Maybe, maybe. Gordon, have you found um, that yet? Sorry? No, sorry, it's okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Um, anyways, uh, and and they talked about, the, you know, the, the records, the um, uh, different um, uh, data sets or, or databases and, and D and D prime are neighbors if they differ on at most one record. Uh, you know, and again, you know, this is where they they base the mathematical uh, calculations that they're doing. Uh, non interactive privacy mechanism gives epsilon differential privacy if for all neighbors and any possibly sanitized database, it fulfills that that function. So, uh, I mean, you know, it, it there is a mathematical definition there that you, you definitely can work for. This is for one individual. <laughs> um, and, and specifically for one record of one individual in a database. So, you know, you, it can be extended to groups, but you need to extend the mathematics involved with it. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, fairly formal, abstract, theoretical stuff that, that they're working with here at this point. Um, and it's a, a probabilistic concept. This is statistical. Um, there's, you know, probabilities and, and likelihoods here. Um, there are issues of, you know, you know, you, you can't guarantee things. Um, any mechanism is going to have to be randomized. And, and of course, um, the uh, importance of randomization you know when we study the cryptography that the importance of that and and the uh, non-trivial nature of it is is definitely uh, uh, something to be uh, regarded but anyway um, oh there's also um, issues here about are you doing differential privacy locally or globally. Um, if you are doing it locally, that means that you, you as a, a local individual, the data generators here in the in the first uh, uh, column, um, the the data generators are responsible for injecting their own noise into uh, whatever uh, data that they they pass on um, that allows you to pass the data to an untrusted aggregator somebody that you you do not uh, trust or there's global privacy um, and that is the data that's generated by people goes to a trusted curator and it's the trusted curator that adds the noise when the curator publishes the data to an untrusted querier. Um, remember this because we're going to come back to it when we're going to talk about Apple's uh, ways of, of implementing differential privacy. And I think that they've done some uh, rather foolish things with regard to how they've, they've done that. So. Uh, in terms of applications here, uh, you know, <laughs> what can you use this for? Um, and uh, as I was uh, doing this, of course, some elections were going on. So, you know, first thing thing up is, you know, voting, you know, voting has to be private. So can we use differential privacy for voting? Forget it. I mean, um, do you want to inject noise? 
into an election <laughs> and into election results, you know, people would not really trust the results. And, and again, you know, you don't want a statistically uh, unreliable election going on. You know, what would have happened uh, in the last election in the United States if, if you know, people were injecting noise all over the place? Um, so, and, and certainly the, uh, you know, the reliability of the election, which, you know, e even to this day, I, um, we just had uh, uh, discussion on the um, uh, the CISSP forum. Um, somebody brought up uh, some of the issues from the Stop the Steal campaign and, and that sort of thing and, and was trying to present it and, and we're you know, trying to say, look, you know, this is, uh, you know, there are, you know, ballot judges, you know, uh, polling judges, uh, election officials, um, uh, both elected and non-elected and hired and, and you know, professionals involved here. And, and, you know, we've got paper ballots to back up what we're uh, talking about in terms of recounts. And, you know, even so, people are questioning the validity of the election. So, you know, if you want to get something really weird like differential privacy involved in it, you just, you know, that is that is not an issue. No, we don't want that. In in commerce, interestingly, um, differential privacy can be used very effectively in terms of auctions. And, you know, uh, a lot of people want either silent auctions or, or sealed bid auctions where nobody knows what, what it is, you know, when, uh, they say auction, people think about, you know, the art auctions and everybody's in a big room and everybody knows what you're bidding on. Um, but that's, uh, you know, th there are many different types of auctions and differential privacy can be used very effectively to ensure um, the best result out of the auction in, in terms of uh, the the person who, you know, the person who is selling gets the best price for what they're doing and the the person who is is buying uh you know is is the person who really you know the the successful bid is the person who actually wants it without uh betraying too much uh information about themselves and the, and their resources um also competitive pricing and again uh, you know, we we see issues of price fixing and and uh, problems in that regard, and and uh, differential privacy can be used to address uh, some of those problems. Uh, and we've already talked about social uh, analysis, data collection, and and social sciences research, and and the uh, greater accuracy of. Um, that anonymous uh, data collection in, in the social sciences and, and in related issues. Uh, now, one of the things that I came across was someone who was proposing that differential privacy could be uh, used to at, as a sort of a check on machine learning uh, because we've we've seen recently a number of issues where um, machine learning uh, can produce a bias. Um, again, I, I believe that we talked about the uh, Hewlett Packard computers being racist, um, that the uh, function that would follow um, uh, individuals on a webcam uh, automatically um, would not do that for dark skinned people. And and so, you know, that's, you know, one uh, possible bias, but there's there's a number of uh, much more insidious uh, biases that may uh, come into play in, in machine learning and uh, those related algorithms there. Um, so uh, I, I would say that we have to be really, really careful at this point because um, we are using a, an untested uh, technology in differential privacy to uh, 
try and fix a problematic and basically only slightly tested technology in machine learning. And uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, it's, it's sort of like the people who are running around saying blockchain is the answer to everything. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely got some uses, uh, but I think we need to learn a lot more about machine learning and differential privacy before we can say that we can uh, use differential privacy to avoid bias in that. And, and uh, again, somebody uh, was talking about federated uh, learning and, and I believe uh, app, some of the Apple stuff uh, relates in there. Uh, again, we're gonna come back to that, but I'm not, not real sure about that. Uh, now, I, as I pointed out right at the top, differential privacy is not that type of privacy. So, um, you know, looking at things like GDPR and uh, the uh, privacy legalities, uh, you know, most privacy law around the world, except for the United States, doesn't have any, uh, stick to these principles. And you will notice that um, they really aren't areas that can necessarily be addressed uh, by differential privacy. Um, so, I would be perhaps careful there. Uh, I'm just wondering here. Uh, no, oh, Hinder, have you got a mic open or anything? Um, anyway, uh, but uh, you know we can't really know um, if it's lawful. Um, we. There we go. Um, now, um, is you know uh, again the the purposeful nature. We we need to have a, a specific purpose to collect the information, and so it's um, it hard. You know, differential privacy might be uh, possibly used there, but it it's uh, difficult to assess that. Um, the uh, reporting on a subject um, uh, that relies on on full access to the database. So again, differential privacy isn't going to come into play there. Accuracy, well, you know, we can't use any noise in there. Um, the uh, uh, consent for disclosure, again, that's not going to involve it there. Right of correction, uh, not going to be an issue. And jurisdiction transmission, maybe there there may be certain aspects in terms of the transmission to a jurisdiction that doesn't have equivalent protection if we can guarantee a certain privacy budget uh, with regard to uh, uh, you know a transfer to a, a different jurisdiction so um, there you know there are a few but only a few areas uh, of our traditional legal uh, areas in, in regard to privacy, that differential privacy is going to uh, involve it. And finally, we get to Apple. Now, Apple has made a big deal for the last five years or so um, about uh, their commitment to privacy. And one of the things that they have been pushing in relation to this is differential privacy. They're saying that they've incorporated differential privacy broadly into Apple's technology. Well, you can't apply differential privacy broadly to technology. You have to apply it specifically to reporting on databases. Uh, so that's, you know, right off the top, they've, they've got a problem with that. Now, what they say they're doing, uh, they favor short-lived identifiers. Um, so this is, uh, you know, stuff that's not going to identify you over the long haul. Well, uh, we've seen before that, you know, uh, there's possibility for de-anonymizing st this stuff if you use it a lot. Collect data in privacy-friendly ways. Again, that, um, 
Well, we'll we'll look at this a bit more as we look at the the local and global uh, stuff that they do. Increase transparency and control to gain user trust. Eh, yeah, right. Um, empower users to make good privacy decisions over this really complicated technology. I'm not sure that's really working. Use new tools to build privacy into your app. Maybe, maybe not. Um, it'll be interesting. So. Um, Apple has said that it's an opt-in situation. So, uh, you know, any of you guys use Apple's? I, I asked some uh, a friend who's who's really big into to Apple how to find the differential privacy settings, and he initially did not know. He did find it, um, and it was pretty deeply buried. It's not something that as an Apple user, you are going to uh, find readily on your own. Uh, how do they do it? Well, they they do talk about statistical noise and, and some slight biasing on there. Um, is that random? If, if you're biasing it, you know, uh, that can uh create some some issues with regard there and the privacy budget not too many data are collected from any given individual which is interesting when you start to think about what they actually use it for and and how they use it um one of the things that they talk about and i mean you know this is really kind of bizarre is how you use emojis which emojis do you prefer uh, which emojis do people prefer in general? And uh, when you look at uh, some of the the uh, implementations of their privacy budget in, in regard to this, uh, their privacy budget is fixed rather than calculated. So it, it isn't adjusted on the basis of how many people uh, uh, you know, do you have in this total data collection and, and how many items um, are being chosen from any given individual? It's just fixed. And so they they actually lose the difference. Any any research value in what they're doing loses the difference between high users and casual users. Um, and then we look at the, the local differential privacy and local storage. E emoji choice is going to be quite personal anyway. So why does Apple need to know it? Why don't can't they just collect that data on the phone, keep it on the phone, pop up the emojis that you use when you want them purely on the basis of local data collection? Um, and in, in any case, um, they don't seem to use local uh, uh, differential privacy versus global differential privacy. Um, they they do seem to well they they talk about injecting noise, but how do you introduce noise to the choice of an emoji? Do, do they just you know throw in a poopy every once in a while? Um, it. You know, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense the, the way they're talking about it in terms of what we know about differential privacy. Um, they they do erase the IP number or serial number. Um, but again, why do you need differential privacy in, in this regard? Why is it important to know to, to collect this data on, you know, all the the users? And it's not, again, all the users. It, it, um, is is a, a fixed uh, uh, a number of, of entries, regardless of how many uh, emojis you do pick. Uh, and so it's going to be, you know, very limited. And, and so what is the value of this uh, data collection at all? Um, it's it's really rather bizarre. Um, the Apple uh, smartwatch and and uh, the debate data privacy in Apple's apps. Um, the smartwatch collects an enormous amount of information on you, your pulse, your oxygenation level, 
your location um, in, in three dimensions, you know, so that it can tell your altitude to within one foot, supposedly. Um, so what's the, the privacy budget in regard to this? You know, it is, you know, the, the smartwatch is always on, at least, you know, one would uh, imagine it should be for some of the applications that they're talking about in terms of your health uh, and particularly your safety. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's always returning this data. Uh, again, you know, um, are we going to do local differential privacy? Uh, versus local storage. Now, you know, can we store all this information on the watch? Uh, is the watch going to be communicating with your your phone on uh, in terms of the data collection? Um, you know, and, and what do we do about total number of records, uh, limitations on the records from one individual, um, injection of noise? Um, you know, you don't want to introduce noise to health data. Um, and if we erase the IP or serial number data, you know, how do we do health determinations or uh, do studies on longitudinal data over time? Um, it just, you know, given the promises that Apple is making about why people would use their devices, uh, in the, the way that they say, that they are using differential privacy does not make an awful lot of sense. Um, Apple has also uh, started providing these privacy nutrition labels as of uh, December of last year. Um, and, and they really do look, uh, I mean, they, they physically, look, the layout looks like the nutrition labels you get on, you know, cans of beans and, and stuff like that. Um, it, it says uh, something about data collection and, and the use is collected by Apple, but really when you go in and look at the details of that, uh, and again, that's that's one of the, you know, I put that URL into the, uh, the stuff in the chat. The, um, you look at the details there and it really doesn't tell you very much. It, it gives you about the same information that you get from, uh, the Android, you know, because Android tells you, you know, um, this app requests access to this, that, and the other uh, data or or functions on your phone, and uh, so it basically, it's it's just the same thing. So you know, calling it a privacy nutrition label isn't uh, well is really kind of misleading uh, because it really doesn't tell you anything about privacy and it doesn't uh, give you, you know, it, it doesn't use uh, differential privacy. So another CISSP question, which privacy law does differential privacy support? British privacy law, Chinese privacy law, uh, European Union privacy law, or US privacy law? And the answer is D. There. So a British privacy law is, is still primarily based on the privacy directives. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, it, they've, uh, I believe since they uh, did the Brexit, Brexit finalization thing, um, they have passed a law saying that uh, uh, their privacy law is going to be, a, uh, you know, uh, compatible with GDPR. Uh, Chinese privacy law, yeah, yeah. Um, China actually does have a privacy law officially, and it pretends at least to be compatible with the original privacy directives. Um, uh, European Union, well, GDPR is mostly just the original privacy directives again. Uh, it that the new accountability directive might have to do with how well you protect what you have collected, but. Um, the U.S. well, the U.S. doesn't really have any privacy laws. They have disclosure laws, but differential privacy has to do with disclosure and how much you can disclose and the way in which you can report disclosure and so on. So, uh, the the laws in the U.S. that that you know do relate to privacy, the, the, those very few are primarily concerned with how much you can sue when people disclose your data. 
And so, you know, differential privacy probably has a, a fair amount to do with that. So that's a, the closest uh, that comes to it. So um, you have zero privacy anyway. So the, the five stages of data privacy grief here, uh, denial, it doesn't affect me. I don't even use Facebook that much. Anger, whoa, how do they have five gigabytes of data on me? Bargaining, is it worth letting companies collect so much of my data for free services? Depression, Facebook is only the tip of the iceberg. And acceptance, there's a special on mint chip ice cream that might cheer you up, mint chip. So, uh, there we go. Uh, that is differential privacy. And, and again, uh, next presentation is InfoSec Ethics. So, uh, is there, are there any questions? I should have asked that at the break, but anyways, any any questions on any of that, all of that? Hi. Yes. Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting subject. Um, uh, you know, fairly complex, actually. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, thank you. rather complex. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I won't be in the next meeting, May 4th. Uh, May 4th, InfoSec yeah. Ethics? Yeah, I won't be there because we've got a, you know, our, uh, you know, sort of uh, startup, startup meeting of some sort, you know, so. Ah, okay. Well, hopefully Vern will have found out how to publicize this thing by, by then and we might uh, get a few people Okay, <laughs> okay. No, thank you very much, Rob. It was great. And what happened to James? Uh, Vern knew what happened to James. I think it's he mentioned. Flashing, but uh, 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 one is flashing, but uh, not saying anything. Yeah, he's probably gone to the bathroom. <laughs> Anyway, thank you much, Rob, and uh, see you in a couple of, not a couple of, four, three to four weeks, I guess. Uh, Am I on now? Is that me now? Okay, you're on now. Oh, Any I questions? hit a button. I hit a button on my headset. That was a trouble. Hi, yeah, James. <laughs> James actually had an issue um, at work. He had a server problem he had to deal with. Oh, I ah. see. Okay. Okay, the, uh, Vern, did you have any uh, questions? Comments? Not particularly, um, other than um, trying to answer some of the questions, which um, I managed to get one out of three. <laughs> <laughs> and those were actually just guesses. Yeah. Uh, the, actually, the EU one, I thought I had a fairly good guess there because the um, I, I know with both ISM and NTT, my two employees over the last 12 months, we've had to write these, uh, have these courses. Oh. And, and at the end, it's like, okay, how how you need to be secured, whatnot, and and privacy and all this sort of thing in terms of the uh, issues as it affects um, healthcare. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole different issue. It's like you're okay, you're remoting some remoting to somebody's computer, and you see privacy information on the computer screen because yeah. you're trying to fix the very program that's broken that displays this sort of stuff. Yes. So you're supposed to, uh, how does it say? You can look at it, but you can't see it. You, you can look at it, but you can't see it. Yes. Basically, your eyes closed. Yeah, <laughs> or eyes blurred or something. Oh, God. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's yeah, definitely an area that, yeah, could could be explored, at least. Yeah. Um, and I must admit, I was some of the stuff I was my eyes were glazing over a few of these things. My apologies, but I did I did stick it through here though. Oh well, thank you for sticking it through, and I apologize yes. for making it making your eyes glaze over. Uh, <laughs> no, you're you're actually fine, Rob. I think I would have been completely asleep had you not been the presenter. <laughs> yeah. It was a super job, and anyway, thank you very much, guys, and yep. uh, see you. See, okay, see you, Mahinder. Yeah, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. So, Rob, there's a meeting on May the 4th and then May the 18th, if I'm to believe my calendar. 
Yep. And then we're in June. Yep. Okay, and I'm trying to. Th I did manage to get the uh, uh, meetup page. I now have access to it. I think as I mentioned uh -huh. that, so I just got to get the information in there and correct it or add to it or whatever I need to do. But at least I'm in there now. I just got to basically schedule that among everything else I'm scheduled to do about okay. you know, work related, personal related, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, in terms of the uh, the next meeting details, there's there's this, of course, and, and the um, well, the the details link there that goes to a page that I keep updating. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, you know, how you can get in and, and where the uh, particular uh, recordings are and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. So oh, yeah, I'm on that page right now. Yeah. Next meeting, April 20th. Well, now that's the previous yeah. meeting. Next meeting is now May 4th. Yeah. It's May 18th, June 1st, June 15th, and then a break for summer. Yes, I think we need one by then. Then September 14th, September 28th. Yep. Okay, so there's, and you've got details for May, April 20th and May 4th. Uh, uh, what I, am I missing I think here? it's April 20th, it was April 20th, meeting link or this, May, May 4th, meeting link or this. And then May yeah. 18th, it just says presenting technical evidence in court. Yeah, the, the May 4th is the last one that I've, I've got the specific uh, meeting link up. Fair enough. And I, I do updated as i go yep that that's um yeah i still got to catch up to you so that's not a problem <laughs> <laughs> okay well at least the may 4th stuff is there and and yep. uh, information on how people can get in okay okay good well i think it's just the two of us on here now so um yep. i'll let you go and thanks again and um I'll, I'll pass on hi to angela and you pass on hi to gloria Thank you. Will do. They're probably wondering, are we going to get back together again? I'm thinking, oh, Rob and I talk every two weeks. But uh... <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'll have to do that soon. Yep. All right. Take care. Okay. Have a good evening. Yep. All See right. you and on. Right See you May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. <laughs>